Hey, space fans. Uh, it's me, Tarek Malik, uh, with Space.com, managing editor of Space.com, and... Cal Cofield, staff writer at Space.com. And, and we're here to talk about gravitational waves. Big news, Cal, with the gravitational yeah, waves. Yeah, gravitational waves. Uh, so you guys might have heard, it's probably in the news now, that the Laser Interferometer Gravit Gravitational Wave Observatory, That's LIGO, LIGO uh, made a second direct detection of gravitational waves the gravitational waves came from two black holes spiraling around each other and crashing together and merging into one. And we just wanted to take a minute in case you were wondering what gravitational waves are and kind of break this down a little bit. Yeah, we've got the full. Really exciting. We've got the full story at space.com, obviously. But uh, but Kala, we'll take it away. Kala, I'm the spaceship person, obviously, <laughs> at space.com. Kala uh, is is big on physics. Tell us what gravitational waves are. Why okay. uh, why should we care? Yeah. So I mean. They're just really cool in principle. Um, they remind us of a really, really cool thing that Albert Einstein discovered. So prior to Albert Einstein coming up with the theory of general relativity, everyone thought that space was sort of this backdrop against which everything happens. It was like the stage that the cosmic play happens on. In other words, that space was fixed, that it was rigid. It wasn't something you could change or, or interact with. Um, but Einstein showed that actually space is flexible, it's bendable, and it's influenced by objects within it. Uh, in particular, space is warped by mass. So if you have a particularly massive object, like our uh, stand-in black hole right here, uh, space is not actually just a rigid backdrop like this table. Um, instead, to represent space, we have this uh, memory foam pillow. So, this you is know, your pillow? <laughs> this is the pillow I sleep on. Um, we're not a high budget um, <laughs> company. Uh, so, you know, you can, it, it's just a simple example that you could do on your mattress or on a trampoline. When a very massive object is in space, it actually creates a curve. Um, this kind of curvature is what you would see around the Earth if you could see the curvatures in space. And this creates what we call gravity. And, and this is just really, really fascinating um, because what LIGO is detecting is that if you can imagine a heavy object curving space, you can also imagine multiple heavy objects moving in space such that they actually cause ripples to go spreading out. I mean, not unlike if you drop a pebble in a pond or if you hit a drum with a mallet and that creates vibrations in the surface of the drum. Um, that's what gravitational waves are. They're waves in this actual, in space itself, or what's called space-time. So that by itself is just really awesome. I mean, it's just a very weird property of our universe. It's amazing that physicists are able to figure that out. And they have this physical evidence of it now from LIGO. This is, again, the first direct detection of these gravitational waves. So, so they're waves. They're out in deep space. Somehow they get here, right? They just keep radiating yeah. outward. How do they... Yeah. How do they detect them with LIGO? What are they, what are they using? LIGO's got a really cool setup. So these, these gravitational waves, again, they, are, they move through space. They actually compress and contract space. So if you were close to two black holes spinning around each other, releasing these gravitational waves, I mean, that stretching and compression could, could tear your body apart. That these, does not, This yeah. is a physical force. That doesn't sound fun. No. <laughs> Luckily, we are far enough away from any event causing really strong gravitational waves that they, they die out, just like ripples in a pond. They're going to get weaker the further they go. In fact, by the time they get to Earth, the distortion in space is less than the width of a proton, which is just sort of smaller than you can <laughs> imagine, actually. So LIGO has this incredibly, incredibly complicated machine um, that involves lasers and arms, and we have an infographic about this at space.com that will illustrate it a lot better, but they can actually measure that very tiny change in distance created by a gravitational wave coming through. Um, it's, it's really amazing. They use light um, to do it. They show that you know they have these two long arms, and when one of the arms is stretched or compressed by a gravitational wave, a beam of light is going to travel up or down that arm slightly faster or slightly slower. Wow. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's been called the most precise measuring machine that's ever been built. I mean, it, it's just mind-boggling. So, so you said it's a big deal 
for, yeah. for physicists, for astronomers. Yeah. Uh, what are they going to find out from, from detecting now two, three events now? Uh, what, what's it going to tell them about the universe, about black holes? Well, it's important to note that every other space observatory or telescope studies the sky by collecting light or some kind of particle. So this is the only operational observatory that's collecting gravitational waves. And whenever you can get a different, a whole different category of information, you're going to see different things. So these black holes, for example, as they're spinning in space, they don't radiate light. Uh, they, or they don't think they radiate light. We'll see. Um, you know, there's no material around them that's heated up. There's, there's really no way for traditional observatories to see these black holes. So LIGO can see them. It can see things that are otherwise invisible to our eyes. It, it's just like having a new sense, you know, eyesight or hearing on the universe that you didn't have before. Wow. Just think about, you know, suddenly gaining a new sense how much information you could gather about your surroundings. And one of the things they're really excited to do is study objects like neutron stars colliding, which will radiate light, and, and then you could look at those with both telescopes and LIGO, and that's going to be really cool. Wow. So, so uh, does it tell us anything about just what space is, too? I mean... Absolutely. So, again, Einstein was the one who showed that space is this sort of flexible material in his theory of general relativity, and uh, studying gravitational waves is going to allow scientists to better understand that theory and maybe see if it breaks down anywhere. That's, that's a pretty ambitious goal, but it's such an extreme example of that theory in practice that it's going to help them understand it better and, and understand space a little bit better. Um, yeah, so it's, there's a lot of applications in both uh, astronomy and physics. Yeah, it's, it's hard. I think you would be more excited about this. You, I'm not getting that from you <laughs> I've been at bouncing all. around. <laughs> yeah, this, this is so exciting and so cool. I, I have to say it's also really cool. Part of the reason, if you want to hear why I'm so excited, because people really didn't know if LIGO was going to work. It, you know, really optimistic projections said they weren't going to detect things until like 2020. And now we have these two amazing events and it's only 2016. Well, so that's two detections since December. Yes. Of so that's in a year, half a year. It's, it's actually in a, run, a science run of only four months. Oh, and wow. then LIGO is going to start taking data again in September. So before the end of the year, they could have more stuff. So there could be black holes crashing all around us and we just can't see it. Based on, <laughs> maybe not immediately around <laughs> us, but I mean, that's another thing that they're figuring out is like, based on how many they've detected in just four months, Black hole collisions could be happening like every few minutes in oh, the universe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's far out there. There's a lot of empty space. Don't worry, it's not close to home. But they're going to get a better and better idea of like how frequent this is. This right. could be super common. Well, is it like, is it like, uh, is it like a pulsar where it has to be aimed right at you? to be able to see it, or like a transiting planet? It's a really good question. Yeah, there is some degree to which uh, the, you know, where the gravitational waves are coming from and how it's angled to the instrument um, could make a difference in the strength of the detection. These are all things. So again, amazing that they got these two very clear, beautiful signals. I mean, these were just really strong signals. So again, tells you something about how often this is happening. So I, I, I heard the LIGO scientist today saying how this is like the, the start of a, a new like uh, field of gravitational wave astronomy. And uh, I'm just wondering kind of what, what's next, aside from just keeping, you know, making it more, you know, more uh, observational or taking more readings. What's next for LIGO? What's next for gravitational yeah, wave yeah. science? So LIGO is right now only operating at about 40% of its design sensitivity, so it's just they're, they're tinkering with it right now. They're going to start it back up in September. Um, that's going to mean they can search a larger section of the sky every time they improve that sensitivity. So over the next few years, they're just going to be able to see more and more events. Their data sets are going to get bigger and bigger. Um, there is another gravitational wave observatory in Italy that's going to come online in January that's going to contribute to LIGO. They're going to be able to do a lot of cool stuff together. India has announced that it would like to build one. Um, Japan, I believe, is working on one now. In addition to that, there are other ways to potentially look for gravitational waves from the universe. Um, and, and so there are other projects and other experiments that are either on the drawing board or in the process of collecting data. So this really is the beginning in that sense, too, that scientists are finally getting to 
build the experiments that search for this phenomena that was predicted a hundred years ago. Wow, wow. Well, that's, that's, yeah. that's heady stuff. Big science. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Well, you know, so I, I do have to ask because sometimes I see folks ask me and I don't have an answer for okay. them. But there's another thing with the word gravity in it and wave oh, in it yeah. that I get confused with. There's gravity waves yeah. and gravitational waves. We're talking about yeah. gravitational, gravitational waves. And if you could just kind of really quickly... There are what a couple is, of science communicators who frequently <laughs> tweet gravity waves when they mean gravitational waves, and I will, they will remain nameless, but you know who you are. <laughs> gravity waves are actually uh, something that happens, the things that appear in the atmosphere of a planet because of the gravity of that planet. So you might hear in some of our reporting on Pluto from New Horizons, they're using gravity waves in the atmosphere to learn about Pluto's atmosphere, and, and people use those in Earth's atmosphere. So not the same thing. I know it's confusing. I know gravitational is a little longer, but two different things. Very important, the ational <laughs> Very important. part. All right. Okay, great. I think we finally got you to understand that importance. It took a long time. Saying? 15 years it took to, <laughs> to understand it. Then Cala came by. So, no, that's great. Well, thanks so much. Hey, thanks so yeah. much for, for, for explaining thanks that with us. Sure. Um, thank you for, for watching. I hope you liked the, 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 the quick explainer. Obviously, there's more coming out on this gravitational wave discovery from just today and then also uh, in, in the future. So, uh, follow us on uh, Facebook if you can to find out the latest. You can also follow us on Twitter at uh, space.com. You guys spell out the dot there. Uh, you can see that right here. Uh, and you can follow me at, uh, on Twitter at uh, Tarek J. Malik and uh, Kala. At Kala Cofield. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I will look for you next time. Keep looking up.